coming up on KPBS Evening Edition. What the public still doesn't know about the Haditha killings, the lawyer for the last defendant speaks out. Occupy San Diego tried to arrest Mayor Jerry Sanders this morning. We'll tell you why. And a developer is giving new life to an old gravel pit. Could it be a good sign for the San Diego housing market? KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. Pension reform and labor deals will officially go before San Diego voters in June. Today, the City Council put those two proposals onto the primary ballot. One initiative would change the city pension system for most new employees, putting them into 401k-style plans. The other would bar the city from placing project labor agreements on municipal construction projects. I'm here to make a citizen's arrest of Jerry Sanders. Members of Occupy San Diego tried a new tack today with an attempt to put Mayor Jerry Sanders under citizen's arrest. About 20 people showed up at the mayor's office this morning with crime scene tape. They say the crime was last month's temporary renaming of Qualcomm Stadium to Snapdragon Stadium. Snapdragon is a Qualcomm brand and the company paid the city $1,000 to cover the costs of the change. The protesters say it was a sweetheart deal and accused the mayor of embezzlement. Mayor Sanders was not at his office this morning. The protesters say they're ready to go to the district attorney and even to the state attorney general. The killing of five people in Tijuana over the weekend has disrupted a long period of calm in the city. Fronteras reporter Adrian Florido is in the KPBS News Center. He's been following this story. Adrian, what did these killings look like and how do police know this was drug related? Well, the details were all too familiar. Gunmen pulled up to a family's home in a central Tijuana neighborhood, uh, stormed in, uh, forced four men and a 13-year-old boy into the kitchen and executed them. Uh, shortly afterward, federal uh, investigating, sorry, uh, state investigating authorities uh, realized that one of the victims was the brother of a municipal police officer who was recently arrested for uh, having ties to the Sinaloa drug cartel. And so uh, they determined that it was uh, most likely a drug-related crime. Hmm. Now, Tijuana has actually seen a decrease in drug-related killings over the last couple of years. Do you think this is a sign things are getting bad again? Well, you know, it's hard to tell kind of within the context of this isolated calm because it is, at this point, sort of one incident. Uh, but I did ask that question to a veteran Tijuana journalist this afternoon, and he said that, you know, while, um, yes, there has been a, a, an incredible sort of improvement in the situation in, in Tijuana, uh, drug-related murders down about 40 percent over the last year. This is obviously a sign that, um, you know, sort of drug trafficking and all this illicit activity associated with drugs uh, is still alive and well and that the situation isn't under control by any means. Uh, so, you know, we'll have to wait and see whether um, this sort of is an individual flare-up or whether it becomes more of a, of a trend. All right. Adrian Florido, our Fronteras reporter. The California Supreme Court has reinstated a second-degree murder conviction for the killing of a well-known San Diego surfer. Today's decision overturns an appeals court ruling that reduced the conviction of Seth Cravens to voluntary manslaughter. Cravens was convicted of killing Emery Kawanui by punching him in the head during a confrontation in La Jolla five years ago. The lower court had said there wasn't enough proof of malice, but the Supreme Court justices say the force of the punch was sufficient proof. The Commandant of the Marine Corps says the Pentagon's plan to reduce its numbers won't disrupt the Corps' effectiveness. General James Amos says the Marine Corps has been working since 2010 to reshape itself into a smaller but more capable force. You may recall last week the Pentagon announced plans to reduce the Corps by 20,000 Marines over five years. It's part of a larger effort to cut the defense budget. The largest and longest-running criminal case against U.S. Marines ended last week at Camp Pendleton. Staff Sergeant Frank Wooderich pleaded guilty to dereliction of duty in the deaths of 24 Iraqi civilians. Joanne speaks with his lawyer at the roundtable about some facts that never made it to trial.
For nearly six years, Staff Sergeant Frank Wooderich waited to have his day in a military courtroom. His lawyer, Neil Puckett, a retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel, joins me now to talk about the plea. Thank you for being here, Neil. You're welcome. So take us back about a week or so that weekend before your client did plead guilty. What, what did you ask him to consider? We got an offer from the prosecutors uh, that in exchange for his plea of guilty to negligent dereliction of duty that uh, we could basically resolve the case in one day and he would not receive any jail time. And so we asked him whether or not he wanted to do that. Of course, by that part, by that time, we were well into the case, in fact, almost finished with the case and uh, felt like we could win the case, felt like we could get an acquittal. But it was his desire to, uh, to plead guilty primarily to, well, solely to take responsibility for everything that happened that day, to take responsibility for his Marines, his own tactical decisions, because he felt that he was in some measure morally responsible for um, things going bad that day. Now, this wasn't the first time this particular charge came up through this entire six-year process, was it? There, there were other times where you offered to your client would, in fact, plead guilty to this. What did the prosecution say? Well, the, and th this wasn't the first time he'd heard this because a couple of years ago, we actually drew up some paperwork uh, and, and offered to plead guilty to, to a very similar level of offense uh, in exchange for light punishment, and the prosecution uh, turned it down. Uh, we revisited the issue last year. Uh, and again, the prosecution turned it down. And so uh, when, when it came time to uh, talk about it this time, uh, after they had put on uh, three quarters of their case and it wasn't going very well for them, I think they made the decision that uh, it was time to end it. Now, you've seen the coverage, obviously. Obviously, your client has in terms of people responding that this, in fact, was not justice, that 24 Iraqi civilians died. Uh, I know there is some controversy over whether there was a man in a wheelchair or not a man in a wheelchair who was also killed. There were women, there were children. How do you respond to that, that, in fact, this was not justice, that still you had 24 people who died and nobody went to prison? Well, first of all, there are 10,000 pages, at least, of, of investigation, and nowhere in there do the words wheelchair appear, so I don't know where anyone got the idea of wheelchair. Uh, however, uh, remember that uh, there were uh, several Marines who fired their weapons that day, uh, in addition to uh, Staff Sergeant Frank Woodridge. Uh, those Marines were all had, all, all had their charges dismissed through prosecutorial decisions. Um, it's our feeling that uh, perhaps, well, you, first of all, you can't look at the entire case by one court-martial result, by that of Staff Sergeant Frank Woodridge. If you look at that and you say, well, 24 people died that day, um, and and here's look at the light punishment. He's not even going to jail. You, what you have to consider is why didn't the government, through its prosecutors, prosecute every Marine who fired their weapon that day? Uh, it's our belief that had every Marine gone to trial, we don't know what the outcome would have been. Maybe some would have been acquitted. Maybe some would have been convicted. But through the um, crucible, if you will, of a court martial, of a courtroom, a lot of times facts come out and, and uh, juries discover th what happened and what didn't happen. And that's very valuable information. And it's possible, uh, we, can't, we can't redo history, but it's possible that um, if some Marines had gone to trial and if some Marines had been convicted and if some Marines had been punished, perhaps the Iraqi people might feel differently about the outcome of this case because it's not just the Woodridge case. So what is it in those 10,000 pages of testimony that, that perhaps you know and your client knows that has not been revealed in a courtroom? Well, th the problem is those, those answers can never officially be known. Um, we, we have theories about what happened, but one of the problems in, in us being able to not know either is uh, Frank Woodrich wasn't in every room in every house that day. In fact, he didn't fire his weapon in the house, uh, in, in either house where, where people died. So things that went on outside of his uh, vision, uh, he, he has no way of knowing what happened. And to this day, he believes that his Marines um, followed the rules of engagement as best they could uh, and, and did the best they could that day, but a tragic result ensued. So uh, we're not so sure. Were there Marines who should have been charged in that house, but were not charged? No, there, there were Marines who were charged, but in their headlong rush to convict the senior man, Staff Sergeant Woodrich, uh, the prosecutors uh, allowed or offered 
to dismiss the charges and grant immunity to the other Marines in exchange for their testimony against Frank Woodridge. So in your opinion, should that have happened or should other Marines have actually gone to court so that these facts could have been revealed? Well, two things would have happened if all the Marines had gone to court martial. One is uh, some measure of justice might have been achieved. And two is if all the facts came out, in the, again, in the crucible and the truth-finding process of a court-martial, perhaps our client wouldn't have gone to trial on the more serious charges. Perhaps the government would have seen, uh, if there were bad actors that day, who those bad actors were, and they might have reduced the charges from the very beginning. We wouldn't have even had to start this four-week court-martial. I, I don't want to ask you the same question over again, but I, I sense that for the people at home, just to clarify what, what we're discussing now, that perhaps, in your words, if there were bad, bad actors that day in the House, um, that we'll never know that because of a decision for those Marines not to go to court. Understand that I'm not accusing anyone of, of bad actions or criminal actions. I'm not saying that. Well, what I am saying is that because Marines had their charges dismissed and they were given grants of immunity from the government, we'll never know results of their trials uh, to, to better find out the truth of what happened in rooms where weapons were fired where Frank Witterich could not see. Finally, where is your client now and what are his plans for the future? Well, he's still going to work every day at Camp Pendleton. Uh, he plans to process out of the Marine Corps in the, in the coming weeks, so we, we trust with an honorable discharge. And he plans to enter the information technology field. Uh, he's been doing some training and has some networking uh, certifications, and he's looking for a job. If anybody out there uh, has a job in the IT field, uh, give me a call. Thank you so much, No Puckett. My pleasure. Just six years ago, more than 10,000 building permits were taken out in San Diego County. The number fell when the housing bubble burst. But now, construction is starting to make a comeback. Is the housing industry ready for takeoff again? The story from our Biz Tech Desk in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8, Antiques Roadshow is in Eugene, Oregon, at the picturesque King Estate Winery to discuss what to look for in the pursuit of collecting wine glasses and decanters. Then at 9, the Roadshow goes on a tour of Bayou Bend in Houston, Texas, once home to famed philanthropist and antiques collector Ema Hogg. And at 10, Michael Palin is off to Peshawar by steam train and gets an audience with the Dalai Lama. That's all tonight on KPBS. I'm Ray Suarez. On the next news hour, Judy Woodruff reports from Florida on the eve of the Republican primary, and Margaret Warner is in Brussels for the European Union summit. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors, and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award winning news coverage in the years to come. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by A new housing development in Mission Valley could be a sign San Diego's home construction industry is coming back to life. KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson says the project is transforming an old gravel pit into condos, rental units, and commercial space. C.J. Reynolds has shown new homes for years. This is our uh, residence 1X. It is a four-story home. It features three bedrooms, three and a half baths, and it's 1,760 square feet. The Shea Home saleswoman walks through a new model home that's full of designer touches. The price tags begin in the low 400,000s to close to half a million dollars. Uh, many of our home shoppers love this optional brick wall and col columns. It reminds them of a very modern urban feel to it. Her practice presentation hasn't been used much recently. That's because the financial collapse crushed the new home industry in San Diego County. The resulting wave of foreclosures flooded the market with cheap competition. But that may be changing. 
Sudbury Properties is turning the old Grant gravel quarry on the north edge of San Diego's Friars Road into a 230-acre planned community. Marco Sessa is a Sudbury vice president. He says the development will include all kinds of properties. The overall master plan is set to include just under 5,000 homes of really different products and different home configurations both on the rental and for sale and also on the uh, overall you know, price points. The first two phases are already on the market. Behind me you see the Shea townhomes that are being sold to people already. And over here, if you look at this apartment complex, it's going to be ready in a couple of months, 300 units. And Sessa says he's not worried about the condition of the housing market. Part of that is because there's so little housing being built right now. Uh, last couple of years in the county, we built under 4,000 new homes, and that includes all home types. Uh, so there's certainly a pent-up demand that is building. But the company is being cautious about building everything out at once. The first two phases are small, 300 rental units and 200 townhomes, and the rest will be built out over 15 years. We're beginning to market right now two home builders on future phases. We're in uh, full design of the next two subdivisions within the master plan. And it, it, right now, it looks very positive and based on the feedback that we're getting from those builders. One observer says that approach measures what the market will bear. Michael Lee is director of the Corky McMillan Center for Real Estate at San Diego State University. I think it's, you know, a, a good sign that we are putting some new, new units and we're putting them in a central location, but I would be a little cautious yet to say that this, you know, signifies a real turnaround in the industry. Lee says the new home industry was pummeled by the subprime mortgage mess and then the financial collapse. Building permits in San Diego County were running at about 10,000 a year in 2006. The Building Industry Association says that fell to just under 3,000 in 2009. Permit activity has now clawed its way back up to nearly 5,000 units last year. If you look at the level of new home construction, it's been bouncing around at a pretty low level. And, you know, that's really reflecting the you know, difficulties that people have to get mortgages, the trade-up market that I mentioned, the recession and unemployment, all those factors weigh in on the housing market, along with the fact that we have this large inventory of existing homes for sale. Lee says he'll have to see a couple of things before he's ready to say the new home market is back. He says the number of distressed sales need to fall, home prices need to climb, and interest rates need to stay attractive to potential buyers. So far, only interest rates hit that mark. That's KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson. Sales of foreclosed properties in San Diego fell in the final quarter of 2011, while default notices hit a three-year low in December. A national campaign to reinstate limits on political campaigns is trying to gain some traction. Joanne spoke with the head of Common Cause when he was in San Diego last week. If you're a fan of the show The Colbert Report, you probably know a lot about super PACs. They are political action committees that are able to accept unlimited and anonymous contributions from corporations, unions, and individuals. A Supreme Court ruling in 2010 allowed for the creation of super PACs. Comedian and host of The Colbert Report, Stephen Colbert, created his own super PAC. Take a look at this clip. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries five to one. Mr. Colbert, you may form your pack and proceed as the commission has advised in this opinion. Joining me now to talk about a national movement against super PACs is Bob Edgar, president of Common Cause. Thanks for being here, Bob. It's great to be with you. Let's begin with before the Supreme Court decision. What were the rules? Well, the day before, the Supreme Court came down with a very narrow decision, five to four, giving corporations and labor unions the ability to form not only super PACs, but use corporate treasuries for the first time in expenditures. Uh, we had rules in place where corporations already were involved in politics. They had political action committees. They had full transparency. They didn't permit anonymous donors. And so we didn't understand what the Supreme Court was thinking. 
They came out with this decision to say corporations are people, money is part of the free speech movement, and Common Cause, founded to be the People's Lobby, just thought it was outrageous. And we're, we're going to launch a major campaign in the next uh, couple months uh, that's called amend2012.org. We're supporting groups that want to amend the Constitution to make corporations corporations, but not people, and to push back on the idea that money is speech. Now, there were also limits, right, when we had just PACs, not super PACs, in terms of how much could be contributed to these action committees. What were the limits back then? Well, back in those days, the limit was about $1,000. It had been raised to $2,400. Uh, that didn't really change. What changed, those, some of those limits are still in place. What changed is that they gave corporations and labor unions the ability to set up these super PACs take unlimited money. We saw in this current uh, Republican primary where both Romney and Gingrich received millions of dollars from friends not associated with the actual campaign, but they were able to put television commercials up in places like South uh, Carolina and, and Florida, trashing each other as well as praising their candidates, and while technically they're not supposed to communicate with each other, Romney's PAC is set up by some of his best friends and Ginrich's PAC. This election year, this presidential election year, is going to be the most moneyed political year in the history of the United States. And the good news about the bad news of how much money is going to be spent, which will corrode our system, is that I think average voters are going to just be outraged. And we want to push back. We want to get corporations voluntarily not to engage in the kind of political expenditures that is now permitted under uh, Citizens United. Well, a big part of the problem is the lack of transparency. I know there's been s some talk. Here in California, we have rules in terms of political action committees and, and people who donate, and you have to know who they are. But with super PACs, you don't. Isn't that sort of the second part of the really big problem? We don't know be who is behind exactly. all of this. Exactly. They don't have the same kind of rules and transparency. We're working state by state. Here in California, we're working at the state legislative level to put in place uh, rules about transparency. We almost got a national bill passed, but it got blocked in the United States Senate. It only got 59 votes. Now, one would think if there are only 100 senators, if you got 59 votes, wasn't that a majority? And the answer was yes but a small conservative group of senators blocked it with a filibuster. Common Cause believes the filibuster is really unconstitutional, and it blocks things like this. Because that legislation, it passed the House but didn't pass the Senate, foreign companies can now get involved in politics. They can put money into our system. Uh, corporations have the ability to set up these independent political action committees without full transparency. Uh, we just think this is a terrible time for uh, democracy. You've seen the Tea Party movement and the Occupy Wall Street movement. We hope that 2012 will be a movement called Occupy Democracy. Uh, Bill Moyers, who's back on the air on, on public television, a good friend, he came to our 40th anniversary and he said, this is the most dangerous moment in American history for democracy. We're either going to be a nation that's of and by and for the people, or because of Citizens United, a nation that's of and by and for large corporations and the wealthy. Citizens United referring to the Supreme Court decision exactly. that, that allowed all of this to happen. We don't have a, a, a lot of time, but th it's fairly complicated in terms of undoing what's been done, done, though. It's a Supreme Court decision. You're talking about a website, the People's Movement, but ultimately, what can you do to change this? Well, we hope some of your uh, viewers will go to amend2012.org and watch a two-minute video by Robert Reich, former Labor Secretary, explaining Citizens United and drawing people to that website where there's a toolkit of things that we can do state by state, region by region. We'd like to see people go to their city councils, push resolutions, and do the opposite of what normally happens on a constitutional amendment. Rather than do it from the top down, let's do it from the bottom up. Let's have people... So constitutional amendment, that's what you've got to do, well, ultimately. Well, you have only three choices, a constitutional amendment, or change the makeup of the Supreme Court, or hopefully uh, uh, get Congress to step forward and put dis disclosed legislation in place. And it's, it's a tough road to go, 
But common cause, we're a courageous remnant. We're going we're gonna to go that direction. We'll have to leave it there. Bob, Edgar, thank you so much for being here. Really nice to be with you. Next time on Frontline, he could run a dead man for coroner and he'd get elected. After the crime, they find what the police want them to find. After the mistakes, story after story about incompetence, the truth is in the coroner's hands. You call a death an accident or miss a homicide, a murderer goes free. Frontline, ProPublica, and NPR investigate. The truth did go to the grave. Post mortem. Tuesday at 10 on KPBS. The idea of the Freedom Rides is challenging segregation so frontally and so aggressively. We were past fear. If one person falls, others take their place. When I asked God to be with me, to give me the strength I would need to remain nonviolent. We knew that we had taken a stand and that it was going to be better. Freedom Riders, an American experience film. February 6th, beginning at 8 on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Earlier, Eric Anderson reported on a new housing development that could just be a sign of the new housing market getting back on its feet. We want to know if you're seeing positive signs in the housing market. Is now the time to make a move or are you sitting tight where you are? Write to me, jferian at kpbs.org or send me a tweet. You can follow the show, KPBS Evening or like us on Facebook. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. Some members of Occupy San Diego accused Mayor Jerry Sanders of breaking the law last month. That's when he approved a temporary name change for Qualcomm Stadium. Occupy members showed up at his office this morning to try to make a citizen's arrest, but the mayor was out of the office. Tijuana police are investigating the first high-profile flare-up of violence there in several months. Four men and a teenage boy were killed on Saturday night. Authorities say one victim was the brother of a former Tijuana police officer, recently arrested for having ties to the Sinaloa drug cartel. And the head of the Marine Corps says his department was already looking at slimming down, even before the Pentagon announced plans for budget cuts. The proposal would reduce the Corps by 20,000 Marines over five years. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night. We leave you with a look at a cooler forecast.